first, let's look at colonization and succession. In this video, I'm only going to look at colonization and succession in a mangrove swamp. Please don't forget to also look at in a bare land as well as in a pond. First, let's look at the definition of colonization. Colonization is when first we start off with a place that is bare. There's nothing inhabiting there because of any natural phenomenon such as an earthquake or anything like that that will cause the land to be bare. Then what happens is a plant starts to conquer the uninhabited area. That means there's no other plant there at the moment. Then a plant comes and colonizes the area. So it breeds and forms colonies. This is colonization. So it conquers an uninhabited area and breeds and forms colonies. Then what is succession? So now that the first one who has already laid the foundation there, that is called the pioneer species. So the pioneer species will change the environment such that it is more suitable for other species to come and take over. So this is generally what succession means. Succession is when we have a species of dominant plants in a habitat. So initially, the pioneer species is the dominant plant. Then what happens? This species is then replaced by other species. These are called successors. So successors take the place of the dominant species. And this keeps happening again and again and again. So there will be new dominant species each time succession takes place. After the successor replaces the initial species, then it becomes the new dominant species. Now this will continue to go on until a climax community is reached. This climax community is normally a forest. Now let's look at what happens in a mangrove swamp. In a mangrove swamp, we have high tide and low tide. So what's going to happen is, you have to remember where the swamp is. It's at the river bank, near the sea, between the sea and the river. Here, as you can see from the top. So this is the sea, and we have the river flowing into the sea. So this is the area where the mangrove swamp forms. So first, let's look at this. We have a high tide and a low tide. Now what happens is, the first species to come into this muddy area, this muddy area at the river bank, will be the pioneer species. So the muddy area near the river bank is now bare, there's nothing there. Then the pioneer species will come and inhabit that area. So this is colonization, the first species. The first species to come will be Avicennia and Sonoratia species. So these are the genus Avicennia and Sonoratia. So the species of under this genus will come and inhabit the area. Now, before we get into the roots, this zone, the first zone is called the coastal zone. That is the nearest to the sea. So this is the coastal zone. And this is where we have our pioneer species, which is the Avicennia and the Sonoratia. The Avicennia and the Sonoratia have special adaptations that enable them to live at the coastal zone, where most of the time the roots are submerged in water. So they develop a special route known as cable roots. Cable roots run under underground, but this is of course not enough. What happens is these cable roots will have vertical projections. These are known as pneumatophore roots. So if you just focus on the coastal zone now, if you see these brown color things that are popping up, this is not grass. This one is actually the pneumatophore roots. So from the cable roots at the bottom under the ground, they are growing upwards and forming pneumatophore roots. These pneumatophores will go above the ground. So what this does is, this enables gaseous exchange to take place above the ground. And this occurs through what we call lenticels. The lenticels are on the pneumatophores. They are where the gaseous exchange takes place. So this is the adaptation of Avicennia and Sonoratia. Then what happens is, over time, these roots, these pneumatophores, will trap mud. And what happens is that the ground will become denser, will become harder. Now, as this happens, so what is happening now is the environment is changing due to the pioneer species. So this species is changing the environment, strapping the mud, the ground is becoming harder and denser. Now, what happens is, it's not so suitable for Avicennia and Sonoratia anymore. It is more suitable for Rhizophora. 
the next PC. So we have the Pioneer in place right now, but the environment has changed and it's more suitable for another species to come in and that is the Rhizophora. So what happens over time? Rhizophora will take the place of Avicennia and Sonoratia. So Rhizophora here acts as the successor species. So the successor species takes the place of the species that is initially inhabiting that area, replaces it. So when Rhizophora comes in, now Rhizophora also has special adaptation to survive that. Now the ground is already harder, okay, but it's still not very dense. So what happens is Rhizophora has what we call prop roots. Prop roots, as you can see, these roots are propped out from the bark. So this helps to hold it in place, helps it to stay firm, especially when there are strong winds and strong waves. So it will not fall, it will hold it in place. So this is the adaptation of the Rhizophora species. Now what happens is, these prop roots, as you can see, it is a very network-like, so it can trap larger twigs as well as mud. So sedimentation happens much faster here. So the ground becomes, again, it becomes drier, it becomes even denser than earlier. And after a long time, what will happen is, the environment is changed again. The ground is now denser and drier and no longer suitable for Rhizophora to live. So what will happen? Rhizophora, which is the current dominant species, will then be replaced by another species. So this will be the Bruguera. Bruguera species will replace the Rhizophora. Now when Bruguera comes into play, this is the successor species. Bruguera is the successor species taking over from Rhizophora. So when Bruguera comes into place, Bruguera also has special adaptation and that is the buttress roots. These are the buttress roots. The buttress roots also contain pneumatophores. They have bulbs that have pneumatophores that allow for gaseous exchange. Now this is already pretty dry at this stage. So again, the Bruguera will change the environment around it because it has much larger roots and much thicker roots. So what happens is it traps more silt. It traps more silt and mud and it becomes even denser and drier. The land becomes denser and drier. Now, what happens is the land is suitable for land trees. Now we can see at the inland zone where the Bruguera is, the tide is already, even at high tide, there's very little water that reaches that place. So now it's pretty much dry land. So we're going into dry land already. So what happens over a long time, now the species that grows well on dry land will be successors. They will take over the Bruguera. So this is where we get our land trees such as the Nipah fruticans, which is a type of palm tree. And we also have the pandanus species. This is screw pine, our pandan. These are the plants that start to replace the Bruguera. So these are the successors and these are the new dominant species. Let's look at the zones again. So in the mangrove swamp, we got three zones. That is, starting at the coastal area, near the sea is the coastal zone. And then the middle zone, very easy to remember. And then the most inside is known as the inland zone. So these are not very difficult to remember. So remember the species that grows there. We start off with the pioneer species, which is Avicennia and Sonoratia species. And then we go on to Rhizophora. Rhizophora are successors of the pioneer species. And then we have Bruguera species, which is the successor of Rhizophora species. After that, we are going on into land trees already. So let's just look at the aerial view. So if you look from the top, this is what we will see. So from the sea, we have the muddy bank. The muddy bank is where the pioneer species will come, Avicennia. And then you can see just behind that is Sonoratia. So Avicennia and Sonoratia. Sonoratia is still facing the bank. And then you go inside a bit, then you can see we have Rhizophora. Pink color is where Rhizophora is. And then even further inside, you will see we have Bruguera. And after the Bruguera species, then we have the land trees, the land species. This is the colonization and succession that takes place in a mangrove swamp. Now let's look at photosynthesis for a bit. I'm going to focus on the factors that are affecting photosynthesis. 
and also the experimental setup to determine how the factors affect the rate of photosynthesis. So first of all, let's go back to the basics. What is photosynthesis? Photosynthesis is when water and carbon dioxide in the presence of light and chlorophyll becomes glucose and oxygen. So it is important to note here that there are two gases involved. At first we have carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the reactant here and what comes out at the end is oxygen. And of course the product that we are seeking from this process is glucose. This is the main product. There are three main factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. One is the temperature and the other two can actually be seen from the equation itself. So one is carbon dioxide concentration and the other is light intensity. So now let's look at the experimental setup. When we want to measure the rate of photosynthesis, first we need the plant and all the conditions for photosynthesis to take place. So out of the three factors, we must always keep two of them constant and only manipulate one of them. So this is how we are going to measure the effect of that manipulated factor on the rate of photosynthesis. So first of all, let's look at what is needed. We have a hyrella species which is an aquatic plant that is submerged in, not water, this is 0.2% sodium hydrogen carbonate solution. The function of sodium hydrogen carbonate solution is actually to provide carbon dioxide. So the higher the concentration of sodium hydrogen carbonate solution, the higher the concentration of carbon dioxide supplied to the plant. So this is how we manipulate carbon dioxide concentration. By manipulating the concentration of sodium hydrogen carbonate solution that we use. And then we have the temperature, which is of course measured by the thermometer. The temperature can be manipulated by using a water bath. As you can see here, this is a boiling tube that is dipped into a beaker containing water, which is the water bath. So if we want to manipulate the temperature, all we have to do is either heat the water bath to certain temperatures, or if we want it colder, then we can start by putting ice cubes. And so this is how we manipulate the temperature. Then the other factor here is, of course, light intensity. For light intensity, we are going to use a single bulb the single wattage. So there's a constant power supply. And what we're going to do to vary the light intensity is to simply vary the distance of the light source, in this case is the bulb, from the plant. So for example, we can start off with the light source being 10 centimeters away from the plant. And then for the next experiment, we can do 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 centimeters and so on. So by varying the distance from the plant, we are varying the light intensity. And this is how we manipulate light intensity quantitatively because we have a measurement of length. So how do these factors actually affect the rate of photosynthesis? First of all, let's look at the rate of photosynthesis. This is measured in centimeters per minute. Now this is assuming that we are using this setup where this plant is still in the boiling tube but then it is connected to, so we have to remove the thermometer first. So this is the modified setup that we would need to measure the rate of photosynthesis in centimeters per minute. So what will happen is, here is filled up to here with water, and the other one we also have some water. And what we have here is a syringe. So what's going to happen is, as oxygen is produced during photosynthesis, this is a trapped oxygen. So the oxygen is trapped inside and what's going to happen is it's going to increase. This column is going to increase in length. So if we place a ruler here and we measure the increase in the length of this column of gas and we timed it. So for example, you can either set the time or you can set the length that you want to achieve. So normally when we set the time, let's say you set a time of 20 minutes or half an hour, then you measure how much the distance has increased. So if it took 20 minutes, it would be the distance, this distance that has increased, the distance over 20 minutes. So this distance would be in centimeter, and the time would be 20 minutes. And this will be how we get the rate in centimeter per minute. So this is how we measure the rate of reaction. So how does the rate of reaction change with the concentration of carbon dioxide? Let's start with concentration of carbon dioxide. The unit for concentration is in percentage. 
Now, when the concentration of carbon dioxide is zero, since photosynthesis needs carbon dioxide, of course, the rate is going to be zero. But what is going to happen? As the concentration of carbon dioxide increases, the rate of photosynthesis also increases. However, at some point, it's going to start to plateau. Now, the reason that it plateaus is because of other limiting factors. So, this is due to other limiting factors. And what will the limiting factors be? The other factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis, namely the light intensity. So, at a certain light intensity, the maximum rate of photosynthesis that can be achieved is fixed, is limited. Now, let's look at light intensity. So, for light intensity, it is a very similar case. So, when we have, when you increase the light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis also increases until a certain point where it starts to plateau. Now, at this point, why does it start to plateau? Because of other limiting factors, namely carbon dioxide concentration. So, even though we increase the light intensity further, the rate of photosynthesis will not increase because the concentration of carbon dioxide is limited. So, it is limiting the rate of photosynthesis. Now, the other one is temperature. Temperature is a bit different. Our graph for temperature, we have to remember that photosynthesis is a biochemical reaction. If it is a biochemical reaction, it is catalyzed by enzymes. So, in an enzyme catalyzed reaction, enzymes are temperature sensitive. They only function optimally at a small range of temperatures. And this is between, for photosynthesis, it is between 25 and 30 degrees Celsius. So, what happens is, of course, when the temperature is very low, rate of photosynthesis is going to be low. So, for this explanation, you have to go back to functioning of enzymes. At very low temperatures, what's going to happen is, the frequency of collision between the enzyme and the substrate molecule is going to be low. So, the frequency of effective collision between the enzyme and the substrate is going to be low. Therefore, the rate of reaction is going to be very low. However, as the temperature goes up, this rate of collision, the frequency of collision between the enzyme and the substrate molecule is going to increase. This is going to increase the frequency of effective collision. So, what happens is more substrate gets converted into products by the enzyme. So, this will cause the rate of reaction to increase. So what will happen is around 5 degrees Celsius, the rate will start to go up until it reaches a peak between 25 and 30. Now, what happens after that is it starts to fall drastically. So, what's happening after that is from this place where it starts to decline, what is happening when the temperature gets too high, once again we have to go back to enzymes. So, enzymes are proteins and enzyme function is based on its active site. So, at higher temperatures what happens is the chemical bonds that are retaining the shape of the active site is going to be broken. So, as a result of that, the active site is going to change shape and the enzyme is said to be denatured. So, this is where denaturation happens. Enzymes are denatured. So, when the enzymes are denatured, what happens is the substrate can no longer bind to the active site and therefore, the rate of photosynthesis is going to start to decrease. That's it for this video guys, I hope you've learned something, please do help me by hitting that like button and if you've learned something and you think it's going to benefit your friends, please do share this video with them so that they will be able to learn and be better prepared for the exams as well. If you're watching this video, you'll most likely have exams coming soon. All the best to you and see you in the next video.